Welcome to World on Fire, a history of the Second World War. My name is Nicholas Schweitzer. In the previous episode, we discussed the, kind of the background behind the Hurrican Forest and the people who would mainly direct uh, the, the battle. And, of course, that person was the infamous General Courtney Hodges. And we, we kind of dug into a lot of maybe the reasons why he decided to, to go into the Hurrican versus possibly taking different routes around. And ultimately, it led to one of the bloodiest battles that um, Americans would end up facing. It would also roll into perfect timing um, for the Germans' Ardennes Offensive, or obviously what we know as the Battle of the Bulge, uh, trying to push the Americans as far west into Belgium as they possibly could. It was more or less a last-ditch effort. Now, where we left off in the last episode was the 9th Infantry Division making their way into the Hurricane Forest on September 12th. So, as we discussed, Hodges sends the 9th Infantry Division. Now, and now they were they were given a very specific mission, the 9th Infantry Division was. And it's a, it's a reason why I bring up a really hard focal point, is because it kind of laid the foundation for what the next three months would truly entail for these Americans uh, on, on the German border. And, and their main goal was to seize a crossroad uh, at the village of Schmidt. And what ultimately that would end up doing is securing the right flank of the seventh Corps. Um, so if we move forward a little bit from the 55th to the 16th of October, the ninth infantry division entered the periphery of the hurricane. They, they captured 3,000 meters and suffered 4,500 casualties. Okay, so this was in, you know, 11 days total. They secured 3,000 meters, but they gave up 4.5 thousand Americans. Now, this doesn't mean they died. It just means they were hurt, wounded, or in some cases missing in action. Regardless, it was a fighting body that was taken off the American side. Now, by the middle of October, American commanders no longer believed that the war would end in 1944. There's a pretty famous saying, if you go back and read um, some testamentaries, um, of people who fought in the Second World War, some memoirs. If you read clippings and, you know, uh, marketing campaign towards the victory of the Allies in Europe, um, you know, there was the big push at the end of the war in 44, and the Hurricane Forest kind of stopped that. What Americans thought would be this great big push, we, we accelerated our time, um, we shortened the timetable of what it would take to end the war, with our push from France over to Belgium, and now Belgium peering into Germany. However, that would come to a not a total halt, um, but it would be slow. And, and, and there's a hundred different reasons behind that, but if we look at the two big ones, right, the men are tired, and they're facing incredibly thick defense that's not a pun for the hurricane forest it's the defense is getting thicker you're literally in the home country of nazi germany they're going to fight for every square inch or in this case you're going to have to give up more than one man per yard that you're going to take so if you can imagine that in nine days for every yard they took they they sacrificed at least one man so by the middle of October, by, by the end of this, by the end of the Schmidt, the commanders were starting to wonder, okay, well, maybe the war is not going to end in 44. Maybe we are going to slow down. Maybe this is going to kind of grind to a halt. Um, a, few, a few days later, on the 18th, uh, Hodges informed that the First Army would be the main effort and offensive that would begin in less than 10 days. So by the end of October... Um, the Americans were already preparing for another incredibly large push. Um, and, and the objective was Cologne and the Rhine River, kind of what we had discussed in the previous episode. Uh, and Hodges assigned the Seventh Corps to be the main effort. But first, <laughs> but first, they had to free the First Army from the Hurricane. 
to say that they were prepared is kind of an understatement. All right, there was only four infantry and one armored division assigned to the 5th Corps at the time. Um, but one of them had just spent the last four weeks, so an entire month, at a rest camp. There was only one infantry division out of the four, and then add on the armored division. That was rested, recuperated, and ready for a fight. And that's who we're really going to focus on today. That's the 28th Infantry Division. Now, the 28th Infantry Division is very historic in the United States Army. Uh, I'm an Air Force vet myself, so my history on that's a little cloudy. But even I know of the 28th Infantry Division. What most people know them for is their nickname, the Bloody Bucket. The 28th Infantry Division is not a part of the regular army, in a sense. It's not a bash on what I'm getting ready to say, but so please hold tight. They are an infantry division of the Pennsylvania National Guard. So they're, they're called the Keystone Soldiers on their patch is the, the, the shield that you would see for Pennsylvania. It's very plain. Like if you've ever seen um, any Pennsylvania highway markers, anything, they've got like a little, it's a keystone. That is what their emblem was, is they still are a, a division to this day, is um, the 28th Infantry Division was the only division that was ready to go. And they just so happened to have a gentleman by the name of General Norman Cotta at the helm who commanded their division. And Norman Cotta was a part of the West Point uh, graduation class of 1917. He had went to college with uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, a lot of these long-standing generals who are now at the top of their game and leading the Allies through Europe, uh, Norman had spent time with. Norman Cotta was incredibly revered by his men, was very well respected, and on top of that, he was an incredible, incredible battle planner. He knew that this was going to be a nightmare. Once he began to look at everything, and you know, he was told that he would need to plan out... Um, and basically go in and relieve the 9th Infantry Division after their failed attack at Vosneg. So, um, and that should be something that should be brought up, right? So, obviously, Schmidt was going to be a nightmare. However, there's another stronghold called Vosneg um, that the 9th Infantry had been getting pounded on. They literally were losing men left and right. The casualties were becoming almost undoubtedly too immeasurable for the 9th Infantry Division to continue moving forward. And the 28th Infantry Division gets the phone call, basically. Norman Cotta gets tapped. Hey, you're going to send the 28th Infantry Division in to relieve the 9th. But there was something that happened that pissed Norman Cotta off. And that was the fact that his plans were almost identical to what they had given the 9th Infantry Division and was causing numerous amounts of life. And, and to, to put it lightly, they were... Norman Cotta was very vocal, in a sense. Um, he was very unhappy. And he, he let it be known. It, for him, he believed in the principles of war. And even Kata disagreed with the plan, stating that it, it roomed no no room for initiative. It violated many of the nine principles of war, most especially objective and mass. Furthermore, with the attack scheduled for 31 October and the 7th Corps attack would not schedule to begin until 5 November, the 28th would be only one unit in the entire 12th Army group on the offensive along the entire 150-mile front. I think we can all figure out why the sound it sounds as bad as it actually is. 150 miles for one infantry division is absurd. I mean, it would take you days just to walk the line, let alone spread yourself out thin enough to where you can make an effective fighting force. Effective fields of fire don't exist at that point. Really, leadership command doesn't work at that point. Strategy in general does not work. And he complained. The... the he knew for a fact the Germans would be able to mass against him in separate regiments and destroy him. And he went to General Garot and insisted 
consisted of a single division attack against one single objective, and that would be Schmidt. He felt that Schmidt was the bigger objective. He felt like it was more strategically sound to what they were overall trying to accomplish. But just like, you know, many, many other things in the military, uh, it fell on deaf ears. He tried to placate his his by telling him that they was going to reinforce his nine infantry battalions with a tank battalion, a towed tank destroyer battalion, a self-propelled tank destroyer battalion, three combat engineer battalions, and a chemical battalion. He also informed him that the 28th, 28th Division Artillery would also have eight battalions and a separate battery from 5th Corps Artillery, reinforcing the division's assigned artillery. A further six battalions from 7th Corps Artillery would also be in to reinforce the roles. And he would ultimately get these, right? Um, so the 110th uh, Regiment was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Theodore, or my mistake, Lieutenant Colonel Theodore Seeley. The 112th would be uh, the, one of the main combat effectiveness roles, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Carl Peterson, um, who had a story of himself uh, serving in the First World War. However, even the genius that Norman Cotta was, he made some very large mistakes prior to the operation. One of them being that he never sent patrolling into the Hurricane Forest. Didn't send patrol into one of the thickest and most heavily defended lines in all of World War II. Right, we, we discussed in the last episode the Siegfried Line, and the, it runs right through the Hurricane. It is a part of the Hurricane. Um, or I, I guess I should say the Hurricane is a part of it. And there was no reconnaissance, no patrolling, nothing. And it's not like you could fly over, right? The, the overhead was so much that you couldn't send any form of reconnaissance over top of the, the forest to see what was below. If you did, you wouldn't be able to see anything. It was almost impossible. So to not send men in there to patrol kind of leaves them blind. And his second mistake really kind of ties in with the first one, right? So his second mistake was in, in the maps that he had of the Hurricane Forest. He decided to take a hill by the I, I, and I could be I could be pronouncing this wrong, but it's Call. I believe it's K A L L. It's the Call Trail. Um, and and as I said in the last episode, there were really only two trails in which you could take. Um, the Call Trail was the narrowest of the two. Now, you, now you're probably wondering why is this a mistake? Because it was his supply route, and he anticipated that the trails would not be muddy. They would not be damaged. They would not be obscured. Go down the list of things that could go wrong in the middle of heavy combat, especially when it's winter's vastly approaching, when rain is coming down. A narrow trail can almost disappear. So his second mistake was that he was adamant about this. And, and, and there's reasons why. Um, it is because... Using the narrow trail makes sense. Um, and, a, okay, what's my enemy anticipating I'm going to do? If you've got a wide road and a small road, which one's then we going to expect you to drive down? He's going to expect you to probably drive down the, the big road, um, the road that's much wider, not the road that's more narrow. However, however, this could have been alleviated by sending a patrol in, by doing quick reconnaissance. Like I said, you couldn't fly a plane over and, and uh, there's no way you can get a good reading of what a trail status is. Um, this can only be done by eyewitness accounts on the ground. And by not sending a patrol in, you don't know until you're there. Right? It's kind of like you and your buddy going to walk out in the woods. And then 25 minutes later, one of you decides to turn around and go, so exactly which way do you want to be going? I thought we were going to go this way, but I have no idea. You're going in blind with a map. It's probably very outdated, which it was. It's not like they had updated maps from the Hurricane Forest in World War II. Um, these maps were pretty vintage for their time. So they're also going off bad intelligence, in a sense. Here's your intelligence. It's 30 years old. 
You know, it's the best we got. So by sending in a, a reconnaissance, it definitely could have been alleviated. And this would be incredibly devastating for the 112th. Um, the 112th Regiment would basically get smashed into pieces once they started heading through the call trail. Uh, it was it was muddy. It was overgrown. Uh, and once artillery started falling on top of them, it basically obliterated their path. And you were going off of uh, hopes and prayers and that your compass was going to lead you into the right direction and that the maps were still as accurate as they were years ago. And, and the third and last, and to me, it's probably the most important, especially when we think about modernized warfare, Norman kind of made the decision to not support the infantry divisions with armored divisions. Okay. If you want to roll this back into numbers, so I guess we could say that the first one is most important and was more of a foundation for all of it that by them going in and realizing how heavy the defenses were, armor would have helped them tremendously. Tremendously. It would have changed the game for them. However, by the decision not to do it, the infantry was in there alone. Foot soldiers with small arms weapons, you may have a couple that, oh, you, you may have an engine, you know, someone who's got some sort of explosive projectile such as a bazooka or satchel charges or, you know, a, a couple different things. That wasn't going to make a difference, right? If we're talking about an 88, which we'll talk about later, they were shooting flak at soldiers, right? Flak guns that they would shoot at airplanes. Miles into the sky, they were shooting these at, call it point blank range. Nothing can stop that. There's no, look, like it, it'll chip away rock. It'll, if they shoot it over your head and it explodes, that's it. It's, it was unimaginably unfair for the Americans. And this was due to the fact of, you know, think about it. If they would have had armor to assist them in fights like that, how much would it have changed? What makes this even better is once this all gets kicked off, um, the 28th attack is actually delayed for 48 hours because of heavy rain and fog that blanketed the area. So we talked about our trail, right? 48 hours of incredibly heavy rain and then slap on incredibly dense fog. There's not very many people who can figure out where the hell they're going at night, right? Let alone in a thick forest you've never been in with outdated maps. No reconnaissance beforehand. It's muddier than hell. And you're basically walking through clouds. Okay, so now we're getting a good visual representation of what these guys in, in the 28th is getting ready to go through. So at 0800 on November 2nd, 5 and 7 Corps artillery in support of the 28th Division artillery initiated a 60-minute, a one hour bombardment into suspected enemy positions in the hurricane right this was going to be the ultimate the last say so before the infantry battalions the infantry regiments the infantry divisions all of the infantry um entered the hurricane so they give an hour-long bombardment um and and, and in that time there's about eleven thousand rounds that are shot into the hurricane um, and, and they vary from all different sizes, but what matters the most is 11,000 rounds in 60 minutes were fired at enemy, suspected enemy positions. Immediately after the bombardment ends, the 28th rises out of their foxholes. Um, at the same time, um, the 110th and the 109th um, begin to push. That They're making their pushes, and the Germans open up on them. Artillery positions that had presided the entire area for months just oh totally smashes the Americans advancing. It, so much so that the Vesser, I'm a I'm a I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly. The Vesser Vey Valley was impassable, and within 24 hours, the 109th would dig in and spend the next five days. Occupying their positions, defending. 
So what had initially started as an assault, right? The 109th is getting hammered. And they're not the only ones. It's everybody. The 28th is in a very, very bad situation. I know what you're saying. Well, how bad can the, the 109 be at this point? Well, uh, the 1st Battalion had captured part of its objective, um, but had failed to seize the crossroads, which basically allowed the Germans to link, right? They were able to connect their supply chain. So they were able to effectively just play defense and be able to continue to move in the way that they needed to be strategically advanced. 2nd Battalion occupied the bend of the, the German or Hurricane Road, but it was impossible for them to get high ground. Basically, every time they would try to take high ground, they would get battered back down. It was impo- They were at the objective. They just couldn't secure it. 3rd Battalion, on the other hand, uh, rolled into a, a, a minefield. They had no idea it existed. They didn't know it existed until soldiers were detonating the mines um, almost simultaneously. The 109th was hurt so bad in that five days where I said that they dug in that they had 1,275 killed or wounded in five days. That's a huge shave off a fighting force, especially when you're one of the main components of it. The 110th, who was to the south of the 109, um, they were in worse condition. Uh, the 2nd and 3rd Battalion met strong opposition from Germans who had been entrenched and waiting for them um, and, and basically were pushed back to their starting positions. Thick minefields and a lack of viable roads, thick mud, dense woods, uh, made forward movement literally impossible. Um, now the 110th wouldn't give up. They, they would keep fighting. They'd keep swinging over the next 10 days. But every single attack failed. Um, on the 13th of November, when they were finally relieved, every officer in the rifle companies was either dead or wounded. And out of the 160 men that entered the forest with the 110th in 10 days, there were 57 left. So and now and we're talking about just a, f- a few days, right? In the grand scheme of things, 10 days, 5 days. We're losing thousands of men. In 10 days, you cut your fighting force from 160 down to 57. And every commissioned officer is dead or wounded. You're in trouble. And this is just the beginning. The 112th um, was lucky enough to be um, with an attached, an attached tank company from the 107th. And, and, and they, were, they were attacked east through Germany pretty quickly and captured lightly defended villages of Vosnack. Now Vosnack's barely it's a small city. It's a small city, but it's it's strategically good for an army waiting for an attack or planning an attack. It's very small, about a block long and about 2000 yards in total length. So it, it's a it's a very small I wouldn't even call it a town. <laughs> It's kind of just like a, a, a small, it's a, a, a literally a small village. So they go in and they secure it. And the 1st and 3rd Battalion attacked Reichenskall into the woods, but could not cross the Kahl River Gorge due to intense German small arms and artillery fire. So once again, they're facing the same things over and over again. Um, it's these entrenched defensive positions. They're ready for it. The Siegfried Line is proving over and over again to be an almost impenetrable defense. And Lieutenant Colonel Peterson, who is leading 112, makes the decision decision to bypass Reichskoll and sends his battalions with 3rd Battalion in lead through Vossenack and into the call trail. Incredibly muddy. And, and, and they, they met light resistance. Only um, 1,300 had captured the village. And basically... Kata is on a push, right, to just complete the objective. His men from 3rd Battalion of the 112th end up basically not sleeping for 72 hours. They get to the Call River. Um, they're, or they're across the Call River, and they're, and they're told to dig in. They dig in incredibly poor, poorly to create a defensive position along the Vosneck. Uh, the Komerschitt and Schmidt 
<laughs> and here's once again the bigger problem is the fact that they had beaten back Germans in order to control these cities, and they were f- and Kamakata did not send another patrol to go see where they retreated to. So basically, allowed them to get away and dig into however they wanted to in order to prepare themselves again for another American push. So we have Americans who are dug in improperly, not prepared to defend incredibly, the, literally the front line. And on top of that, you have no idea where your enemy went. You gave them an opportunity to prepare for your next push. The 112th got barely any sleep um, before the German counterattacks began. Um, which was almost immediately. Um, The the Herkin forest quickly devolved into a brutal small unit struggle that was getting picked apart by artillery barrages. Uh, Robert Smith, who was a medic with the 112th, who ended up writing a book called Medic um, about his time in Europe, um, stated that positions changed hour by hour and day by day. What was an American line soon became German line and vice versa. At night, troops from both sides will infiltrate enemy positions, so that the morning, no one was quite sure who was surrounding them. So if you can imagine, each night that you go to sleep, if you're able to go to sleep, you would wake up and you could quite possibly be looking at the enemy in the foxholes next to you. The terrain was quickly limiting uh, what the the Keystone Division was capable of. German advances quickly pushed back the 28th, and eventually it caused a full withdrawal back across the Call River. Uh, Supply lines and medical evacuations uh, were centered around the the Call River Trail, which ran right through the heart of the 28th. It was heavily shelled, leading to limited evacuations, which means you can no longer move your casualties, which means their likelihood of dying in combat, flew through the roof, and you couldn't be supplied. And that didn't just mean ammo. It didn't just mean medicine. Uh, That also meant food. So not only are you running out of the capabilities to defend yourself, you're you're at this point now starving to death. The, The Germans were pinning the American downs into positions with mortar and artillery strikes, um, and, and more importantly, what, the tree bursts that would shoot shards of, you know, trees, these huge, dark, massive, thick trees, it would send shards of, at the speed of a well that, that an explosion can produce, it would send these shards through human bodies. So the only way that you could be safe, and there's many veterans who've came out and stated, the only way you could be safe was if you hugged the trees. And at the end of this, I'm actually going to give two really good stories um, from men who'd given oral histories about their time in the hurricane, and both of them mention hugging trees in order to save their life. The 28th Division held onto their sector the best they could, um, even with fresh replacements filling their lines. Um, From November 2nd to November 19th, the Keystone Division uh, fought to hold and made limited advances. Uh, This was an incredibly heavy loss period of time for them. Uh, 248 officers and 5,452 enlisted men uh, became casualties. Uh, And then there were many cases where entire chains of command were obliterated. They were no more. They were totally... um, dissolved from the top down. Now, the 28th did a great job of stopping the Germans. The Germans were told to reclaim German territory at all costs, and they tried their best. Uh, The 28th, however, put up a phenomenal fight. The 28th ended up taking uh, close to, I believe it was 1,200 prisoners. Uh, they inflicted 4,000 casualties, which obviously we can we look and see that those casualties are much lower than they were on the Allied side. However, replacements are a big key part, not fighting on two-front war. We were pushing in one area, the Germans were fighting in two. The fighting at this point had become incredibly brutal and just became a repetitive war of attrition of who was going to lose first. Now, we can understand this is just one infantry division. Um, out of dozens who are currently fighting in this area. Um, They just happened to be in a pinch where they were meeting some incredibly heavy resistance. The Bloody Bucket would eventually be relieved on November 16th for rehabilitation, but it would not be their last 
trip into Belgium. And uh, what I mean by that is the following month they would be back, um, which is where we'll pick up on the next episode with the Battle of the Bulge. Now, earlier I stated that there would be two sco- two stories that we'd kind of go over. And um, the first one is that of a gentleman by the name of Norman Johnson. These are interviews that were completed with the National World War II Museum. Uh, Norman was a part of the 8th Division, um, more specifically Company D, 1st Battalion, 13th Infantry Regiment. Um, And by the winter of 1943, he was crossing the Atlantic on his way to go fight in Europe. Um, And and originally, they left England for France in order to relieve an airborne division uh, that had been battered through um, Operation Neptune, or Operation Overlord. Uh, His first taste of combat would be in St. Lowe in France, so... By the time that he gets to the Hurricane Forest, he's, uh, he's, he's a pretty veteran um, soldier. Uh, he's definitely got combat experience underneath his belt. And so they pushed east. Uh, they were going at Germany at full speed. They were encompassing about 20 miles a day. By October, they were on the doorstep of the Hurricane and heading in to relieve pressure from the 9th. It was here where Norman would be m- mentored by many of those who had been fighting desperately already in the forest. A uh, young NCO from the 9th told him, if you hear explosions, you better hug a tree. And, and he even vocally says that he didn't think anything of it until it happened. And he would find himself constantly underneath trees. And he spoke of the men who would not, who would be ripped to shreds, if not by the artillery themselves hitting them. Or from the tree burst sending shards of wood through their body. And, that, and another story that almost relates perfectly to it is the 18-year-old Private William Meyer, Company B, 1st Battalion, 309th Infantry Regiment of the 78th Division. He was a replacement. Um, so he was actually sent from England to a replacement that was already fighting in the Hurricane. He said the fighting was so close um, that they would be fighting from less than 100 yards away, and the Germans would only attack once the sunset went down. They were unable to dig into the frozen ground, and Meyer's fellow men uh, quickly became targets for tree bursts. The Germans would know where they were at, and they would fire tree bursts right above them. Uh, with no cover and no help, shrapnel fell to the earth, killing and dismembering members. Um, and he said that he recalls vividly the only thing that he could do was put his back up against a tree. It would talk about a perilous situation where the only thing you can do is get as close as you can to a tree and pray that that saves your life. Um, so these are just two men that went through that, and it it kind of, you know, rebuffs th- what I stated earlier of, you know, how awful this was. These men were moving at inches, inches an hour and getting slaughtered for it. Um, there, there was no ground that was left that didn't have blood on it. And, and yeah, and so into our next episode, we will be discussing kind of the the German warm up for the Ardennes offensive, or how we view it as the Battle of the Bulge, um, which is the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany on the Western Front. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in two weeks.